Today is a show I've been looking forward to for quite some time because I love this guy's work. We're going to be talking about focusing on the moment with Kevin Girage on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. This is the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all those stories and challenges that happen in between. And today's guest is a Texas-based photographer whose work I absolutely love. I want to welcome to the show, Kevin Girage. Kevin, how are you? Doing great, Steve. Great to be here. It is, it is so nice to meet you. I, I have looked through your portfolio now. I don't know, probably three or four times. I mean, I've lost a lot of time browsing through your website. And as I look through your shots, I, I do this with every guest, right? I, I, and I recommend people do do this. If you find a photographer that you really love, go to their website and really browse their portfolio because you learn a lot about somebody's approach to their art by doing that. And, and there's something that sticks out to me when I look at your work. You're somebody that, is successful in multiple genres, weddings, college sports, pro sports. So when somebody asks you, hey, Kevin, what do you do? How do you describe that to people? That's a great question. And yeah, I, I kind of started things out backwards. I actually was a portrait photographer first and then jumped into weddings and then into sports. Most people kind of do it the other way around. Um, so when I'm asked now, I, I don't do as many weddings as much. Uh, right now, I pretty much do a lot of pro and college sports, and then I still do a lot of portraits because portraits, believe it or not, is probably my first love. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that mm -hmm. actually is interesting. So do the portraits revolve around the sports or you do a, a separate portrait biz of just portrait clients? Yeah, I have both. I have a separate portrait clients, but then what's great about it is when I started work doing more and more pro and college sports, some of the clients that hired me for that also had needs in the portrait world to photograph athletes and so and do portraits of athletes. So it kind of lent itself to just fit in naturally. So I love doing portraits of athletes and I do that quite a bit as well. So it's neat. You know, USA Today is one I know. They hired you to take portraits of, of members of various, you know, U.S. Olympics teams. Um, in fact, you've done a lot with USA Today, right? Correct. Actually, shooting most of my pro and college sports is through USA Today or Imagine right now. Um, and then I also have the college football playoff contract on my own. I'm their official photographer for the national championship game every year. So that's um, those are kind of pretty much my action shooting um, clients, the biggest clients I have there. I mean, I have a few others, you know, for leagues and things like that I'll shoot for. Um, I also shoot for some stuff for Panini America who makes trading cards. Um, so I'm kind of all over the place on on clientele, but yeah, that that's pretty much the main ones. You know what I find interesting? I'm sitting here thinking to myself, he just glossed over the stuff that he's done for USA Today like it's <laughs> nothing. You covered the Sochi Olympics, the Rio Olympics, the South Korea Olympics uh, for USA Today. You've done Super Bowls, Final Fours, World Series. You mentioned National Championship game being the the you know, official photographer for college football playoff mm -hmm. national championships since, since it started, right? 2015, whatever. Correct. 2014. Yeah. Okay. Correct. This all leads to awards galore. Like you've got, uh, the one that stuck out to me is you won first place. This is recent, actually 2022 world sports photography awards, first place in the basketball category. That, that is correct. Yeah, it was kind of, it was funny because I woke up one morning to an email and, and I don't enter many contests anymore. I used to enter a ton through, when I did portraits and weddings through WPPI and PPA, I'm sure you've heard of. Um, and so I hadn't done too much in a sports, you know, contest yet. And I was like, you know, this sounds like a cool contest. Let me enter. And so I sent in a few images and then woke up to an email one morning a few weeks ago saying, congrats, you've won first place in the basketball, you know, category. And I'm like, wow, out of the whole world. So it's pretty cool. I was, I was pretty psyched about that one. That's, that's one that'll make you jump out of your skin. And it's interesting. It was basketball yeah. because when I was going back and forth as we were picking shots, my mind kept saying his basketball work, man, his basketball work. I need to cover the basketball work, <laughs> but then the shot we're going to cover today, which is not basketball just jumped out at me, but your basketball work is fantastic. I, I'm curious. If you had to pick one, you know, event, one one sporting event, do you have a favorite to cover? Yeah, people all ask me what what is your favorite sport to cover, and honestly, it's probably between basketball and football is what I really love to do. Um, I kind of grew up playing both of them. 
um, you know, and watching both of them quite a bit. So um, if you pin me down, I'd probably say basketball just because I, I just love everything about it, college and pro level. Uh, but both of those are pretty up there. Um, you have you don't have to run as much or walk around as much shooting um, basketball as you do football, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is place. always a <laughs> there's there's icing on every cake. So here I want to get into some general photo questions with you first before we bring sure. up the shot. What's the most difficult shoot you've ever had? And when you run into a difficult shoot, what what is the key to success? Oh, good question. Are we talking portraits? Are we talking games? What are, what are we talking here? All of it. What do you want to know? All of it. Uh, portrait shoots, I'll, I'll just go there first. Like say I photograph an athlete. It's a lot different. Um, those of us that photograph portraits for a living usually have clients that pay you and you know, you have an hour, you have an hour and a half to deal with them, to, to work on what you want to do. If something changes, you fix it. With, with athletes, and when you're working for, you know, leagues and, and, and just these tight schedules that they have, you're lucky to get five to 15 minutes tops to do what you have to do to make a photo. Like all those Olympic photos you're talking about and those shoots I did, I had probably 15 minutes tops with each person, um, which is not a lot. And sometimes like, you want different looks, so you have to have three you know, setups in one room and you have to go bam, bam, bam. And like, you know, get the expressions, get them to buy in, get them to feel what you're looking for all in a quick amount of time. You can't, you know, you just don't have time to mess around. You, you think if something screws up, you just have to move on or, or, or deal with it. You know, you have to be able to quick think, move, think, um, know your settings, know your equipment very well. Uh, for if something, it doesn't work, if a light doesn't, you know, fire, what do you do? You know, things like that. So that to me is definitely more challenging than when I have a client come to my studio um, or we're on location and we can just, you know, take our time, do whatever we want, you know, be a perfectionist totally. You have to just kind of pre-plan ahead on those other shoots and just um, try to nail it. So I want to follow up on that then. Then what is the key yeah. when that when those things happen and a light doesn't fire or whatever? A, what's the key to making that work out in the end? And B, you said an interesting phrase that I love. You said you have to get them to buy in. How? Okay, one of the things I always do, and I got this from shooting weddings and portraits, is you and I, you know, know, or I, I, let me start over. Me as a photographer knows exactly what I have in my head as a vision for what I want. Your subject right. doesn't know that, right? And so as, as a regular portrait, you can kind of take your time, show them. Well, okay, I do the same thing with the athletes in mind. I will actually take a photo and then I'll actually show them on a camera or point out to them what I'm looking for. And when they see it, with my dramatic lighting, and they're like, okay, I see what you're doing. Let me see if I can do this better. Uh, a great example is this. I recently did a the NBA rookies this year. I did a portrait shoot for them in Las Vegas for Panini America. And we had a basketball rim in my area. And so I actually had them do a jump like they're going to dunk it, but do something really spectacular. Well, the guys couldn't reach the rim. I mean, some, it was pretty tall. Some of them could, but they didn't want to really expend much of, too much energy because they don't want to hurt themselves. And I don't want them to hurt themselves doing a portrait. So I got them to go up kind of like in the middle and just kind of do it. And then they didn't understand. So I showed them the back of my camera and then it still looked amazing because they're on their way up making a move as opposed to being all the way up. And then when I showed them how their legs could be spread and it could it look like, you know, you're Michael Jordan or someone just, you know, dramatic with a monster dunk, then they all bought in. They're like, oh, yeah, I can do much better than that. You know, then they, they gave me what I needed. And so that's kind of how I like to to share my vision with them. And I think it's important whether no matter what you photograph, you know, share that vision so that your client understands and then they're more apt to help you and help you get better expressions and better um, poses. I want to talk about your portfolio more though, because something I did on your portfolio as I'm browsing through it is I noticed, I noticed a technique I think that you use a lot. You use your shutter speed in amazingly fantastic ways. Like it's almost as though you, you use a shutter as a physical prop in the scene by dragging it or, or doing something. I'm thinking of, you know, a baseball one where the arm is extremely blurred, but the face isn't. How, how do you see your shutter speed in relation to storytelling? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, and I've never been asked that before, but it's actually very true because some of the shots I want to do, you know, to be creative requires you to mess with the shutter speed. Like for example, if I'm panning and I want to get a runner, let's say in any sport, 
baseball, let's just say baseball, and I want his his, his head to be sharp, all but everything else to be blurred out. I might probably shoot that at a twentieth of a second, or you know, even lower, and then have like a high, you know, aperture probably or low aperture. I guess that'd be f20 or something like that and just kind of pan with that so everything's sharp in the face but not the body and, and things like that or i could try the other way if i, I want to get stop action all together i'll shoot a really high shutter speed you know one four thousandth of a second or five thousandth of a second whatever just to freeze everything uh and if i'm using studio lights i do the same thing i will you know shoot at f16 at full power on my strobes to to turn day into night you know i i do play around with that quite a bit so that's that's really cool that you um actually caught that or saw that there's there's two shots in particular i'm thinking and it's one of them is an overhead like down on football and then one of them is a pitcher's arm that's really really blurred and but there's there's a lot of shots that you've got where you the sh the shutter speed is an integral part of the way you tell a story. And I would argue in today's shot, it's the same thing. Before we get into today's photo, this is a podcast first and foremost. So it is available wherever you get your podcasts in two forms. You can get an audio only version. You can get a video version wherever you get your podcast. So if you search for behind the shot on, you know, let's say Apple podcasts, you'll see two options, the audio only and the video version, subscribe to the one that you want. If you're not on Apple platforms, that's fine. If you go to BehindTheShot.tv, you will see all the different ways that you can subscribe to the show as a podcast. Keep in mind, some of the different methods that you can subscribe, like Spotify or Amazon Music or, or something like that, they only support audio. But there are versions out there that do support video programs. Now, if you are watching on YouTube, obviously, you're getting the video there. All the show notes are on YouTube as well, or not all of them, but most of them down below the like and subscribe button. But if you go to the blog post at behindtheshot.tv, you'll get all the show notes there. And that brings us to today's shot. And today's shot is one that when I first saw it, I thought to myself, like I said, we, we were talking back and forth and, and kind of figuring out what shot to do. And I was leaning to basketball because your basketball work is so amazing. And then this shot came up. Toronto Blue Jay outfielder Jose Batista getting hit by a pitch. And this is why I'm calling this show Focusing on the Moment, because there's two things that jump out to me in this shot. A, that is everything you want in the perfect moment to photograph, right? I mean, it's literally everything you want in a baseball shot. But number two, you managed to maintain focus when something like this happened that you could not have predicted. And I have so many questions for you on this, but let's start with the technical, okay? Okay. First of all, let's, because there are people who want to know exposure details. You'll never recreate this shot, but it kind of helps them understand, especially if they're they're new to photography, where things land. So, this was shot aperture priority mode. Is that correct? That is correct. There was lots of sun uh, and clouds just mixed back and forth throughout the game. So I, I had aperture priority because, and lots of shadows on the field too. And so you might have sun here, shadow here. And so if you had to change your camera to focus on a different outfielder, for example, and he's in the shade while the batter's in the sun, it's just easier to use aperture priority to, to capture the moment really quickly. So do you do you always default to aperture priority or are there times that you will go to manual? No, I'm usually a manual shooter. Don't get me wrong. I love to shoot manual, especially with the new mirrorless cameras we're using these days. Uh, I shoot mainly manual. However, you have a tricky lighting situation like this game was, and I'll get into it here in a little bit. Um, I definitely was going to aperture priority just because I wanted to keep my shutter around the same, you know, three and a half, four, something like that, and, and let, let the shutter speed change um, on how it needed to, to pick it up, whether it be shade or sun. So, so that's why I shot that TV. So you just mentioned uh, your aperture. So let's dive into this. ISO 400 yeah. is what EXIF data showed. Uh, 135 millimeters with a 70 to 200 2.8 lens. So you're in a really nice spot right. on that lens. On a Canon 1D Mark IV, by the way. But Old camera, you're yeah. at one five thousandth of a second at f3.5 with an exposure bias of plus one third because you basically a, a adjusted the aperture priority. So, I, and by the way, you shoot auto white balance, it looks like. So here's I my did. first question for you because this is, this is an interesting one. 
why 3.5? Because to me, when you're shooting a full frame camera at 3.5 and you've got people moving like this, this guy was standing up a moment before this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't know where the ball is going to be. You don't know where the bat's going to end up. I'll describe the shot for those of you on an audio feed here in just a second, but you don't know where his face is going to be on that plane as he falls. Three five just feels like, oh my God, you're playing with fire here, and yet you nailed it. Yeah, I think three five is actually pretty safe. Three five four for the now. Keep in mind, this is a one D Mark IV, so this is back a ways. I think this was on April twenty eighth, two thousand eleven, and okay. and I think I told you this. This was the actual first pro game I ever photographed. And what's funny about this is I got this great photo and then I, it's all downhill now. I can't even replicate this. I've never gotten anything close since. So it's kind of funny when I tell people that story. My first game got the best photo I can in baseball, I think, for me. And I haven't gotten anything better. <laughs> no. Um, to answer your question, though, the 3-5, I thought it was safe. I felt like that's a very sharp um, aperture to be at where I could kind of get one or even if another player, an opposing player came into the frame, I could kind of get them both in focus. I mean, you're not going to shoot at five, six or, or, you know, F eight, just because you want to kind of get a background out of focus as much as possible. And I felt that with three, five, I still had plenty enough of a shutter speed there to, to freeze anything I wanted and, and to kind of get a safe spot where anything around it would be in focus, you know, anything relatively close to the, that, that frame where he would be in or my main subject would be in. Um, so that's kind of why I stuck it. And I always found it to be very sharp on that particular camera and lens combination um, back then to shoot around three, five. So, th okay. Again, I'm looking at this going for me, there's no way I would have gotten this at three, five. There's, I'm just <laughs> not that good, but at 5'6", I mean, that dugout behind it, and again, for the audio listeners, I will describe it. I apologize. But the dugout and the player behind uh, the batter, they're far enough back. You don't think 5'6", it would have blurred it enough? Because you're right. There's so much happening back there. It is critical to this shot that you blurred that background. It might have, but here's the thing. You know, day games um, are interesting because that's the only time, most of the time I photograph is at night. There's usually night games, all right, prime time. So day games are special to me because it's like you get a chance to get um, everything frozen. You get the ball frozen, the bat frozen, you know, the swing. Everything is just frozen in time. And so I wanted a really high shutter. So, I mean, like I think we shot this at five thousandth of a second, if I remember right. And and so I wanted that. I didn't want to go up to F8 or F5, 6 to even kind of, you know, get that a little, little, bit, little bit slower. So to me, that was a perfect five thousand. Because at night, when I shoot at night, I can't get that five thousandth of a second. I'm shooting at a thousandth of a second if I'm lucky. You know, right, and right, that's right. not going to freeze everything like this. So, All right. So for those of you that are on the audio feed, I'm going to describe this shot to you. And I'm, uh, let me just tell you up front, you need to go to the website behindtheshot.tv to see it. And the reason is there is no way I, I can put into words. This is one of those shots that has got so much in it that there's no way I think I can really give you the feeling of how he was able to capture such a complex scene, not just moment, but scene, and yet maintain subject separation and all of those things that we love. So first of all, this right here, as I said earlier, is the moment you want to capture in baseball. Most people I know, I think, would have missed this. There are seasoned pros that would not have gotten this shot. It was your first pro game. Oh, my God. Okay. Um yeah, so it's a tight shot of a batter at home plate, but it is landscape orientation, and the batter is basically, for lack of a better phrase, laying down. Uh, I'll explain in a moment. Camera height is eye height for the guy that's laying down. So it's, I would guess that you're in the dugout on the other side or something like that. Your camera is not six feet off the ground here, right? Correct. The background, I'll get to the player in a minute. The background shows... The opposing dugout or, you know, dugout opposite the photographer, the dugout is blurred. There are words on the dugout you can make out. You can see the crowd in the background, about one, two rows maybe of the crowd. Again, perfectly blurred. There's a player standing there or a manager, something to that effect, standing outside the dugout. You can see their eyes cut off the top of the head a little bit was intentional, I'm guessing, either in post-crop or in camera to not cut off the head. I love that. 
one of the things I actually also love is to the right of the dugout, there's a square in the fence with a solid green piece of backing on it. And the end of the frame doesn't cut through the middle of that, but actually includes the post. Enough of the post that you can see that that little square ends there, which I love, absolutely love that. The player just got hit by the ball. And this is where this just gets insane. The player has fallen backwards. His right foot is off the ground. His calf is on the ground, but his right foot is off and you can see kicking dirt up, right? And the toes are pulled back like he just fell backwards. He's on the ground from that right foot all the way to the right hip, but from the right hip up, he's still off the ground. Like his head is leaning up. Like you're, think like you're laying in bed and you're sitting up. That's what he's doing, except he's going the other direction. His right elbow just off the ground, hand straight up in the air. His left leg is bent at the knee, straight up in the air, like his foot is pulled back. And his left arm is straight up on the bicep and the forearm coming over the top of his batting helmet. That could have been an accidental positioning when he fell. It also could be that he's blocking himself because right above his head, completely horizontal, not being touched by anything in the world, is the bat just floating in mid-space. Love this. And then to the left of the scene, away from the batter. And by the way, I should add, I don't know how the hell this happened. The batter is literally looking right at you. Like right. At, it, it's fantastic. His face is completely recognizable. The entire batter is in focus. And to the to the camera left, so above his right shoulder, uh, is the ball. And there's a puff of dirt, right? So you can see that that ball just hit the dirt right there. Again, everything about this is is just spot on. Did I miss anything? Actually, there's one thing, and it's my favorite part of this frame. You can actually read his name on the bat, the barrel of the bat. I mean, yes. just think of how lucky that had to be, where the bat wasn't turned some other way. And you, I've never been able to see that before. And, you know, literally you see the name, and you can read it. Clear as day. And so, yeah, it, a lot of things had to come together. A lot of luck involved too. Uh, but yeah, it was something else. So let's let's do some background here on this shot. I want to know how you got this. So tell me the story of the shot. Where were you? What were you thinking? What was happening? And then we'll get into the technical details of how you maintained focus and all of that type of stuff. Uh, share with us the little story okay. of this. For sure. So first of all, like I mentioned, it was my first Major League Baseball game. So I was a nervous wreck. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know where to be. I didn't know all the rules, you know, all the etiquette. And so I was, you know, before the game, you know, talking to some other guys that were there. To, and they were really nice and helped me out and told me what I could and couldn't do. So I found this one well. Most stadiums have four wells that you can photograph in. And they're called inside and outside first base, inside, outside, third base. And so this one would be inside uh, first base because it's closer to home plate and it's an inside of first place, first base. Um, so that's where I was. And so I, it's a good spot to use, you know, like a 7,200, maybe a 2470 to, to get batters pretty up close uh, at home plate. And so the story was, you know, he was going, he was batting obviously. And, and, and I mentioned earlier, as we were talking about exposure, the sun was going in and out. So that's why I was kind of shot this after priority. I just wanted to make sure I had a high shutter speed to, to get any contact, whether he hit a home run, whether, you know, anything that happened at the, at the plate. Well, he happens to get hit and I think he's just trying, he's just diving out of the way and he literally just takes a full dive. Um, I don't know how close, I don't remember how close the ball came to him, but as you can see, the ball actually bounced and then just lucky that his bat flipped up like that. And like I said, he's pointed right at me. You know, usually when they dive out of the way, they dive the other way. They won't dive towards me. You know, they dive towards the um, the third base side. So he happened to do that, and, and like I said, it just lined up perfectly and and, and made a frame that I, I'm really proud of. I think, and again, no disrespect meant to those seasoned pros, but we all in this type of live event photography where we don't have control and something happens in front of you instantaneously, and you're you're expecting he may hit a home run and. And you may be thinking of a million other things that could be happen at the, happening at that moment. Getting hit, bunting, um, hitting into left field, hitting into outfield, hitting a home run. There's a million things that could have happened. And so I think a lot of people would have misjudged or miscalculated or misanticipated this moment. 
in your head now looking back what was the what was the key that made it possible that you nailed it i think and i also tell this to other aspiring photographers or sports photographers you need to know the sport you're photographing you need to know it in and out what the subtleties are and you know i grew up watching sports grew up watching baseball i knew everything about baseball i know a lot a lot about baseball i shouldn't say everything because rules change every day um, or every year i should say but i knew that you know once a guy gets hit you want to stay on that it's easy just to get you know photograph the the moment and stop shooting or, or look for something else i wanted to kind of stay and follow the whole sequence there uh, of what happened and i made sure i stayed on him and just there was nothing else more important than a guy getting hit because you never know. You, you always try to get the ball if it's up against a guy when he gets hit. Like, if you know, heaven forbid I get hit in the face or, or anywhere you want to make right. sure you capture things like that. Uh, well, same thing here. He just, you know, this is the aftermath of it. So I, it'd be fun for me to actually go back and see the whole sequence because I honestly have never, never done that. I should actually go back and see what the whole sequence was from that day to see what else I, I might have gotten in that. Uh, but, yeah, so that's, that's what I'd say. I'd just say staying with it and just kind of – you know, having that high shutter speed and having shot at three five, I was confident it would be in focus and and we'd get what we needed. I just kind of picked that one up because I thought it was the best frame, just because you know, like I said, of all the things we talked about lining up. So, but but being in focus again, you have a moving subject. Three five may be enough depth of field for when he was standing, mm -hmm. but he could fall towards you. He could fall away from you, as he said, as you say, true, a lot of times true. they would have fallen towards third base. So, so let me ask you this question. You're a cannon shooter. At least you were then. Correct. I am. How were you set up focus wise? So, and when I say focus wise, I mean, you know, do you use a single point? Do you use point expansion? Are you using zones? Canon, for those of you that shoot Sony or Panasonic or Olympus or Nikon or whatever it might be, most of the settings that exist in what I'm about to talk about do exist in other brands. You can go watch my Canon autofocus that I did with, with Rudy Winston of Canon. But Canon has what I call presets for a lot of these settings that all manufacturers tend to have in one way or another. They're called cases. And in those days, you had cases one through five. You also have an auto case now. What case do you exist on or live on? What focus pattern, AF pattern do you use? And are you a back button focus person or not? Okay, so now... Present day, I'm definitely a back button focus person. Um, I kind of always have been, if I remember that. Yeah, I've always been, and I always kind of shoot sports depending on, on, I'm sorry, cases depending on the sport. Usually I'm around three or four are the ones I like to use the most. Um, and then I'm between center point or the four point, so the one with the cross. Um, but those are kind of my go-tos. I played around actually in a, a game this weekend with the zone focus, which is kind of flexible zone on the new R3. And that's kind of fun to play with as well. I'm still learning my R3. I just had it, you know, not that long ago. So um, it's a lot to learn. It's my first mirrorless. So I've been going through um, doing a lot of experimentation with that, but I love it to death. Um, this shot that we're talking about was shot, like I said, on a Mark IV. So that's a long, I don't even think they had cases back then, if I remember right. I, I might be wrong, but um, I can't I think, remember. I think they did, because I was probably did shooting they? A, I don't think I ever a used 5D it. Mark III then, which did. But it's interesting you say three or four, because I live generally on case four uh, for what I shoot. Yeah, and three or four is, are probably what I would pick as well for that. But and then, of course, yes, I'm back button focus as well. I absolutely love back yeah. button focus. It's interesting that For you're sure. using the four point expansion. I use the the eight point expansion, or if you include the middle point, okay. nine point expansion. The the R three. Since you brought that up, mm -hmm. are you using mechanical shutter? Or are you using electronic shutter? I use electronic now? shutter. Yeah, it, like I said, it was my first mirrorless. So I want to kind of learn it uh, as I go, and I, honestly, I think I'm learning something new every day. Um, with it, and, but I just absolutely love it. Yeah, I use electronic shutter, I use silent mode, I use subject tracking, all, you know, all those things I'm playing around with that I've never had before on any other model. So it's really, it's really opened up a world of things I can do. You know, if you're shooting golf, you can shoot the whole swing in silent mode. You know, you can never do that before. Uh, right. Just the press conferences, you can be totally silent. No one knows you're there. It's great. No one's staring at you. You know, it, it's just things you can get away with getting photos you would never be able to get before. So Is I, there I'm absolutely in love. Is there any other key key part to tracking him as he fell back in those days? Back in those days, I was simply just center focused. I remember probably. And right you just panned chest. as he fell. You just followed him. Exactly. I just followed as he fell. 
And, you know, I'm at 135, so I've got quite a bit in the frame, and I was able to crop it in a little bit. Um, I wasn't totally tight where I'd lose them if you fell out of the frame. So I wanted to make sure that to do that, to make sure I had all of them and a little bit to spare where I could crop in. So, okay, so before we get into post-processing then, mm-hmm. both both cropping after, which is post-processing, but we'll dive into that deeper too, <laughs> but both, whether it be cropping or cropping in camera, the composition on this, I, I really honestly think is kind of next level. The, the crop fits so well, where the guy in the background lands, you know, where that panel on the right ends at a post, the fact that I can see a full row of spectators, uh, you know, where the bat lands on the left rule of thirds, his his uh, head is on the left rule of thirds, his knee is on the right rule. Of, there's so much composition wise in here that I hate the word right, but you know what I mean? That is just exactly yeah. what I want, what I personally want in a picture. What were you thinking composition wise as you were shooting this? Uh, as I was shooting, I'm just trying to get, you know, you're not really thinking about um, exactly how I'd line it up afterwards in, in post or in, in when I cropped it. I'm just trying to make sure I got the moment. That's, that's what I'm thinking in my head. I was like, did I get that? I hope I got that because that would look pretty cool. And, and so I did. So then afterwards, then I'm obviously thinking about those things like you're mentioning, the rule of thirds, um, where to place the how, how tight I wanted to crop it or how loose I wanted to crop it. Um, so there's that. And, you know, in post-processing, it's a little different if I have portrait clients versus shooting for editorial for USA Today is in this example because you're not allowed to do too much in post-processing. So um, you're only allowed to really mess with exposure a little bit, maybe tone it just a little bit, white balance, nothing crazy, and then crop it. That's it. Anything else is, is deemed, you know, you can't do that. Um, a lot of people to, ask me but, when they see when, but, Excuse me. I, I apologize for interrupting you. But, yeah. but when you say no, tone fine. it, you are allowed to, to color correct Right, white balance, color correct. You can color correct, but you can't just go crazy on. You know, like some people do some really wild Instagram filter looking things. Right, you can't right, right. Okay. Really do that. They want it to see as natural as possible. So yeah, it's it's photojournalistic integrity. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what it is. So I don't ever want to do too much in post. Um, and, and like I said, some people there's a little yellow mark you could see to the 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 I guess camera right of the the third base coach there hanging out. And, and people are like, why don't you just Photoshop that out? Well, like you said, it's photojournalistic integrity. You can't touch that. So I, I left it alone. That's the way it happened. Whatever reflection I did. Yeah. What's interesting to me is, and, and I defer to my buddy David Bergman on this, because David is of the same mindset, even though with what we shoot, it's kind of both, right? So what I shoot, when I shoot a concert, my photos may be used in a journalistic way, but they may also be used by the management as a marketing tool or by the venue as a marketing tool. And I can process them both ways differently, but the twain should not to an extent meet depending on the journalistic outlet and different journalistic outlets have different rules. Everybody thinks it's like when I do competitions and we always tell contestants, you know, look, it's what you could do in a, in a dark room. You can dodge, burn, color, correct, and crop. But the truth is Ansel Adams did some crazy stuff in a dark right. room and, and, and you can't do yeah. that stuff. Right. So right. yeah, a uh, little bit different. So what is your normal workflow for pr- post-processing? So you shoot a game, you got to turn the shots around quickly. What do you do after a game with your shots? So let's just, since we're talking baseball, I'll just work you through my baseball workflow. So I'm okay. photographing the p- pitchers first, first inning. I want to get both pitchers from both sides, you know, um, from the side they're throwing at, so I see their faces. So I'll even have to go to the other side, walk around if it's a lefty and a righty, okay? If it's not in the same. So so one dug out, the other dug out, so you're getting both faces. Okay, so after the first or second inning, I need to run into the um, workroom or get on my laptop where I'm standing there and edit a few photos to get the pictures out or whatnot or anything, any action that happened in the first or second inning. So what I'll do is I'll download, I use Photo Mechanic as my software, I'll download the images. And what I do now, is I actually tag images or lock images as I shoot them in camera. So if we have a, a, a pause in the action where you know you get a break, you can look through, I will actually tag an image saying, okay, that's the one I want to download. I will not download my whole take from a game. I, to this day, I don't do that anymore until I come home. I don't okay. have time to do that. So, so I'm downloading just the ingested ones. So literally I'll have like 10 photos that, that actually get downloaded. Then from there, I have to caption it. I have to caption what happened, like who happened, you know, Jose Bautista gets hit by a baseball. In the fir- during the first inning, you know, something like that. 
um, against the Texas Rangers, whatever. And so, so I caption it and then I crop it, tone it, and then I send it. Okay. I use like an FTP software to send it to an FTP server that USA Today has. We send it that way. And then that's how you get it moved. And so you do probably two or three transmissions a game. Uh, it's not just shooting the whole time. Like people are like, oh, you're just there. So you don't just the turn them in no. at the end. You turn them in throughout. When, when throughout, you tone, yeah. what are you using? Lightroom or Photoshop? Or You know, it's funny. I've never used Lightroom, but I use Camera Raw and Photoshop. I just kind of okay. same that way. So pretty similar. But um, so, yeah, I just, you know, just kind of, you know, auto tone sometimes if I need to or auto contrast, things like that, crop it. And then, um, then rename. I'll rename it, obviously, to the standards they need um, for their website, and then I'll send it. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, it's hectic, it, hectic at times, especially football when you're running in and back and forth because you're afraid you might miss something big, you know, while you're right. running in transmission. There's always that chance, you know, you might miss the play or whatever. So, and yet that's the, part the, of the job too is getting those shots up. But here's, here's a question for you when you're in camera raw. I just thought about this. Okay. So, you're allowed to do basic corrections. Mm hmm. I've had people argue and I have argued depending on the use model, right? Because that's really what it all comes down to is the use model. If mm -hmm. the team is using this, they may Photoshop that white, that, that yellow, Thank you know, you. dot Thank out you. of the bottom yeah. right corner, yeah. but you, USA Today sure. won't, right? So all about that use model. So Correct. texture, clarity, those are effectively contrast tools. There are different mm -hmm. widths and, and measurements of edge contrast. Do you mm -hmm. ever use those or are those forbidden? to you i don't mess with all this because there's so many new things now new and like i don't mess with with clarity much i think once I'm, or a couple times i might have messed with but not much i just use a basic contrast um, i'll be levels guy in photoshop so i'll do levels i've just always used that forever so um a level guy i'm trying to think what else i use um i think like auto tone auto contrast because it's one it's quick it's one step one button so to me on photoshop i can knock that out and see what it looks like uh, make sure it's it's dialed in. Now, you know, if I'm shooting more indoor events, you know, I usually have my white balance tuned in to a particular temperature. Um, obviously, out here, I, I couldn't because it's going in and out. And so I, I that I just left on auto. But, you know, if I can dial it in, I will. But I don't have to mess with that as much. But, um, no, I don't really mess with a lot of the things I wouldn't like my, my portrait work. Put it that way. You know what I mean? It's, it's, right. it's weird. It's a different mentality I have. I want to get it right in camera. And also, honestly, I'd say shooting this way, and I shoot JPEG and not RAW because it speed matters, oh, right? Right. It's made me it's made me a lot better photographer because I'm getting most of what I want in camera. Which before I used to like I'd shoot weddings, I shoot ah, I'll shoot it raw, I'll shoot whatever, I'll change it afterwards in post, you know. And now I'm like I could I get it done in camera, which is what I ideally I want to do because it saves my time and I get out what I need. So you know, it's interesting that you mentioned you're a levels guy and it just made me smile uh, because <laughs> I'm a, I've been using Photoshop since version 2.5 and I'm a levels yeah. guy. It's, and yes, I see people all the time say, no, 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 you got to use curves. And yeah, I like curves. Curves are I, fun. Yeah. But if all I want is something yeah. quick, command K, yeah. boom, I'm into levels and I'm happy as heck. So I want to switch gears. I want to switch to a speed round. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Just answer them as fast as you can. Ooh, First okay. thoughts that come to your head. Your favorite sports photography tip. Okay. Uh, get down low and shoot up because then you make the athletes look bigger. Oh, okay. I like that one. And they look like, they look like heroes. Heroic. Don't stand up and because that's also eye level and anybody – can shoot at eye level. Anybody in your, your, your family can shoot at eye level. What makes you different is you have a different angle and you shoot really low, low to the ground and it also clears up your backgrounds. Okay. Biggest photo mistake you ever made or or almost made or did make? Ah, this is easy. Uh, I think I photographed a home run, gosh, when I first, probably a second year into shooting. Um, I was transmitting and then I got up because I saw a guy hit a home run. Uh, I started shooting, and this is before I locked that, that little button that says, do not shoot if you don't have a card in your camera. So I shot this home <laughs> run with no card in my camera. So I'm like, great. Luckily luckily for me, I think the guy, same guy, he had a home run, um, the next one of the other bats in the game. So I was able to get his home run there. So I got a photo of him in the home run. So I saved myself. But, yeah, that was pretty bad. Favorite composition rule if you have one? Um, composition rule. I... Yeah, kind of a big rule of thirds guy, as we talked about. It was just kind of funny. You you mentioned all those things. I, I'm a big rule of thirds guy. Um, another thing, it's not really 
Well, it is composition. I'm really into clean backgrounds. If you can, I look at backgrounds almost first, if I can, if I can, if I'm allowed to move around where I have a nice, pretty background or it tells a story, I will stay there and wait for something to come into that background as opposed to just shoot anything with a messy background. I love it. Love it. Favorite drink. Hmm. Gosh, I'm not a, I'm not an alcoholic drinker, so I'd probably say just Diet Coke. Ooh. It's kind of boring. Kind of like boring. that. Huh. Yeah, there you go. Diet Coke, baby. Uh, favorite band or singer? Oh, gosh, that's that's a tough one. I love Coldplay. I love Pearl Jam. Um, old School Journey. Um, I did like the Foo Fighters. I'm all over well, the Foo place. Foo Fighters so. are great live. Journey, I was lucky enough to see Journey with Steve Perry at the Forum in Los yeah, Angeles. Uh, 1978, I think it was, with... Um, uh, Thin Lizzy, I think it was opening. It was such a great show. Oh, wow. My first concert was Def Leppard, by the way. So I like Def Leppard, too. First Old concert school. I ever photographed, actually, was Def Leppard. Def Leppard and Heart. No way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Def Leppard and uh, Heart. Oh, okay. Heart. Okay. And, 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 I, I went to that tour because there was someone else on that tour. I actually went to a concert later There was on one that. guy that oh, just wow. played a guitar, yeah, opening on that tour. But it was a great, great tour. So last question. Is there a photographer out there? that you think more people should be following? Oh gosh, there's lots of photographers out there. Uh, it's hard to name just one. And, and oh, man, that, he stumped me there, man. There's so, there's so many. Uh, it'd be, I wouldn't be doing the others justice if I didn't name just one. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of young, young kids coming up, a lot of creativity I'm seeing. That's what's really exciting these days with all the new technology to a lot of a lot of up and comers are really um, real creative and they're showing it. So I, I love seeing all the, the young kids coming up um, and, and just showing new stuff and, and trying new things. I, I really love the originality that, that a lot of these guys are doing and showing. And so um, making us kind of, you know, step up our game and, and always be creative. In, in fact, that's one thing I've always done. I try to, to get a different type of photo at every single event I shoot or even portrait session, try to get something different. Um, Another thing is just like, I know I'm changing this a little bit. I'm just thinking of all these thoughts. It's, it's like if I have three photographers in one area and we're all in one area, I will move to another area because I don't want to get the same photo everyone right. else is going to get. You know, I'm yeah. always trying to be a little bit different to stand out. And sometimes it'll burn you. But you don't get the safe shot. But sometimes something else, you know, sports is unpredictable. Things can happen and you'll get something that no one else gets. And that's what puts you over the top. I love it. Love it. If people want to connect with you, Kevin, where can they go? What's, what's your website and what's your, uh, your, your Instagram socials, et cetera. Sure. Uh, the website is just w.kjimages.com and on social, both Instagram and Twitter, I'm at Kevin Jiraj on both. Okay, perfect. And so that everybody knows all the links for Kevin, anywhere you want to find him, those are at the blog post at behind the shot TV. And again, they are on YouTube down below the, uh, the the like and subscribe buttons. Kevin, thank you so much for doing this, man. I really, really appreciate it. And I and I also want to tell everybody before we close out here, you got to go look at his portfolio and you'll see what I mean about those dragged shutter images. They are so good. Kevin Jiraj, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. It's great being here. Appreciate your coming by. Make sure you head to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. You can find all the ways you can subscribe to the show as a podcast there, audio only or video. You can also find all the show notes for today's show or any show that I do. If you want to follow me, it's stevebrazel.com. And then on socials, my personal is just at Steve Brazel. It's like the country Brazil with two L's or at Behind the Shot TV. You can find me on all the socials, although I don't spend any time at Facebook anymore. It's pretty much just Instagram or Twitter, or I'm on Vero now too, by the way. So you can head on over to Vero and check that out too. Make sure you join us next time as we take a look inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot. 